Hello, my name is Laura Allegro, and I am an adjunct instructor with Tarrant County College in the Long-Term Care Administration curriculum. I'm very excited to be here with you today and to talk about abuse and neglect in long-term care, what it is, how to recognize it, and when to report it. Let's start with residents' rights. Each resident has the right to be free from abuse. It is a basic human right. No one should ever have to suffer abuse or neglect at the hands of another. As an administrator, it is your primary role to ensure that the care of the residents is your top priority and part of that care provision is making sure that no one in your facility ever experiences any type of abuse and neglect. Now we know that situations do arise where there will be occurrences where someone is abused or neglected in a long-term care facility, but your goal is to know how to recognize signs of someone that might be being abused, to recognize burnout in your staff, to know the different kinds of abuse and neglect, and how to train your staff to protect the resident first if they should come into a situation where they become aware of suspected abuse or neglect. One of the things that you have to remember is that not only is reporting abuse the right thing to do and your responsibility as an administrator, but reporting abuse is the law. There are monetary penalties associated with failure to report abuse and neglect. And any reasonable suspicion of a crime against a residence has to be reported to the appropriate law enforcement. It is your responsibility to do this, and it is your responsibility to make sure that your staff know to do this as well. It is important to know that there are definitive regulations that are set forth by the state and federal government that prohibit abuse in nursing facilities and describe what must be done in order to meet the regulations associated with abuse and neglect in the long-term care setting. One of the regulations is that the facility has to develop and implement written policies and procedures, and they have to follow these policies and procedures when it comes to abuse and neglect, reporting, investigating, identifying, and so on. They have to work out a way to establish these policies and procedures and provide the training that is required so that the staff know what they need to do to ensure that all of the allegations are properly reported and investigated. If a resident makes an allegation of abuse or neglect of any type, it must be reported and investigated appropriately. It does not matter if the resident has dementia and might be confused. That is for the investigation to decide. What the administrator's role is to do is to be that investigator to determine if in fact abuse or neglect did occur. The regulations state very clearly that it is required and that anything that might result in serious bodily injury have to be reported. And they have to be reported to other officials as needed. The investigation process is how the administrator determines whether or not an allegation is substantiated, 
unfounded. That five-day report that you give to the state following your investigation of an, a reportable allegation is how you submit the outcome of what it is that you discovered through your investigation process. The regulations stipulate then that the state has an opportunity to review the information that you've provided from your investigation and then they determine whether it's going to be a desk review or if they need to come out and get more information. So now that we know that we have to put an abuse prohibition plan in place per the regulations, what does that look like? What are the components of an abuse prohibition plan? Where do we start? So we start with hiring the right employees. We provide screening to assure that we are hiring individuals and providing them with proper training, which is the next component. The training of the employees is very, very important. The third component is the prohibition of abuse. How do we prevent abuse from occurring in our facility? The fourth component of an abuse prohibition plan is identification. How do we identify a resident who is the potential victim of abuse or neglect at the hands of our staff or perhaps a family member or perhaps a roommate? The fifth component is investigation procedures. How do we properly investigate an allegation of abuse? And then comes protection. How do we protect the resident while we are conducting an investigation of abuse or neglect. And then finally, how do we report and respond to alleged incidents of abuse or neglect within our facility? All of these components must be clearly outlined in your abuse prohibition plan. And I will tell you that when a surveyor comes into your building for any reason, for a self-report, for a complaint from a family, or for any other reason, they are going to ask you to see your abuse prohibition plan. Have extra copies made in your survey binder because that is something that they are going to ask for. There are certain things that a surveyor will ask for when they come into the building and you can guarantee that your abuse policy and procedures are going to be requested and they are going to expect that you have all of these components reflected in that abuse policy and procedure and plan. So let's start with the first component screening potential employees. It is so important to make sure that you are properly screening the people that you are going to bring into your facility to hire to take care of your residents because it is so important that they are quality individuals that have the residents best and most foremost their 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 best well-being at heart. It behooves you to find out how an employee that you are planning to make an offer to work in your facility, find out how they have worked in their prior jobs. Get a professional reference. Get two or three, however you many you can get, because an employee will generally work for you the way that they have worked in others. They have a pattern of work. Either they're tardy all the time or they're not. Either they are a team player or they're not. Some people you can kind of mentor and kind of tweak different aspects of their personality, but in general, a person's work ethic is formed most likely prior to applying for the job that you have at your facility. So if they've worked at three other facilities, it definitely is of benefit to find out how this employee will work at your facility. 
You must obtain a criminal background check. Make sure that they don't have any type of criminal background that would be a bar of employment. Certainly, occasionally, you'll see on a background check, you know, um, theft of uh, an amount less than $50. Most likely, that is uh, someone wrote a, a bad check. You know, you have to know that people are human beings and that people do make mistakes. And, you know, a, a bad check written in college, um, unbeknownst to the individual that perhaps it had come back to the bank, and not clearing that and it showing up on your record is not a bar of employment. It, it also is not necessarily something that would speak to the fact that this individual would be someone that would misappropriate residents, um, you know, property. If you see a pattern of that in someone's background check and it's been recent, it might be something that you might want to consider and be like, hmm, you know, if they're, you know, experiencing major financial difficulties, this might not be someone that I want to bring into the facility to care for my residents. Certainly anything that shows up on a background check that gives you pause, even if it's not a bar of employment, you should really strongly consider because once you get this employee into your facility, then they are going to represent you. Because once you bring them into the facility, if they had things that should have been of concern to you on their background check and there is an incident that occurs in the facility, you can guarantee that you're going to be questioned on, you know, why did you hire this individual in the first place? You know, it, it showed that they had patterns of X, Y, and Z. So definitely, you know, go, go with your instinct on your new hires as far as their background and their references. You also have to verify all of your employees, all of them, department managers, non-licensed staff, everyone has to go through the uh, nurse aid registry and misconduct registry because that will tell you if they have had any type of report related to their uh, conduct within the industry. And my recommendation as a best practice, I've been doing nursing home administration for a long time, is that you also, as a best practice, not all companies require it, but you can do a pre-employment drug test screening as part of your hiring process. And it is very beneficial to know if you have someone that is going to be predisposed to have a substance abuse issue. You do not want to find out after the fact when you've hired someone and there has been uh, some type of incident and you do a, uh, you know, say they injure themselves and during this incident and um, they, it turns out uh, when they go to be treated um, that they have uh, substance abuse issues, um, that they are impaired. It is always much more difficult to seek out any type of drug testing after you have hired someone. You have to have probable cause to suspect based on their actions that they are under the influence. And it's difficult to do. So your best option is to make sure, again, in the hiring process, that you're screening the people that you are bringing into the facility to care for your residents. They also have to go through the sex offenders registry as well. And again, you must keep a record of all of these things in the human resources office in a certain type of filing system, whatever that filing system is that you choose, but typically a notebook with the, um, the uh, misconduct registry is, is a good way to keep that. Uh, and then also with your um, background checks, um, keeping those as well, because you will be asked for those and um, you will need to be able to provide those um, during your annual survey for each employee and also upon request if there was an investigation of abuse or neglect within your facility or some type of complaint. 
So now you've hired your employee and you've done the best that you can do to screen on the front end to make sure that you have not brought someone into your facility that's going to present a problem for you and your residents as far as abuse, neglect, misappropriation is concerned. You're going to want to provide them with training on the prevention, intervention, detection, reporting of abuse and neglect. And you, there are regulations that I have outlined here in the PowerPoint that are associated with what those education requirements are annually and how it relates to um, the procedures for reporting incidents of abuse, um, as well as uh, dementia management, and um, also uh, what types of activities constitute abuse, neglect, exploitation, and misappropriation of resident property. You're going to want to make sure that your employees are crystal clear on what the types of abuse are and who to report them to. And that is something that you do initially when you bring them into your facility. Some of the essential areas that I would recommend for your training and that all staff should receive annually is what constitutes abuse, neglect, and this misappropriation of resident property. You know, it, common sense is not that common. You would think that you would know that you can't go into a resident's room and take their food because you would like to have a snack. You cannot go into a resident's room and use their computer for your school report. That is misappropriation of their property. That is their computer. It is not for your use. There are so many instances of circumstance where an employee will say, well, I didn't know that that would be a problem. Well, if you don't make sure that you train them on what could be a problem for them, that's the problem because common sense is not that common. They need to know how to report if they suspect that a resident is being abused or neglected or that they are having things taken from them. You know, they, they need to know how to report it. A housekeeper needs to know how to report if a resident says, hey, when Susie comes in to change me each night, she always takes one of my containers of macaroni and cheese. She never asks me, she just takes them. They need to know how to report that. They need to know who the abuse coordinator is and they need to know that it's their responsibility, regardless of their position, that they must, once they become aware that something is not right, that a resident is being abused or things are being taken from them, they have to know how to report and you have to make sure that they understand that it's their responsibility to do so. And they need to be able to do that without fearing retaliation. You know, they have to have the ability to feel safe in coming to you as the administrator and know that you're going to do something about what they are reporting to you and that they are not going to somehow be penalized for that. And they can, if they, if you do retaliate against an employee who makes a, a you know, some type of reporting um, of, an, of a reasonable suspicion of some type of a abuse, neglect, or a crime, they can, they can actually report the, uh, the facility and they definitely, you know, would have a case if suddenly they've made a report or an allegation of some sort and then they are being written up for X, Y, and Z that never seemed to be an issue before. So you have to make sure that you let the staff know that they are safe to come to you, that you're not going to, you know, go to their coworker and say, Susie said, um, you know, that you always, you know, do this, that, or the other. It, it's, it's, um, needs to be confidential when these things are being reported so that you can properly investigate. 
we have to discuss the signs, uh, you know, of um, frustration and stress in coworkers and residents. Make sure that the staff are uh, aware of, of, you know, if, if their coworker is is becoming really short fused with um, the residents that are in the dementia unit. You know, they need to know that it's okay to say, "Hey, you know, Susie used to be so good." with working with the residents who have dementia, but it seems like they just really are getting on her nerves lately. You know, she's snappy with them. She's not abusive, but she's just not engaged the way that she was before. You know, maybe it's time to take Susie out of the dementia unit for a while, give her a breather. And then, you know, as a caregiver, she might be able to recharge her batteries and then be able to go back into the um, dementia unit with a renewed sense of of caring, but sometimes, and it happens more often than you would think, our caregivers get burned out, and that doesn't mean that they're bad people. It doesn't mean that you know that they that they don't like their job. It just means that maybe they just need a break from some of the more challenging um, residents that they might work with routinely. And then, you know, you, you can have, you can ask them, you know, when they are feeling as if they can return to that environment. But, you know, you need to discuss these things that there, that these types of things can and should be reported um, to the abuse coordinator or to the supervisor. And, you know, you also need to let your staff know that the protection of the resident is paramount in a situation where abuse or neglect is occurring. There must be intervention. You can't have a resident to resident altercation and just allow it to go on until it comes to its fruition, whatever that is, whether, you know, you have to intervene. You know, you can't allow a male resident to go over to a female resident and and touch her inappropriately and and not intervene in that situation you have to train your staff the appropriate way to intervene so that it does not escalate the situation you have to make sure that they have that skill set because again they may not know what the appropriate way to intervene in in sometimes these um, what what could be an uncomfortable situation they, they need to know how to intervene and you have to provide uh, your dementia care uh, training annually also um, and it has to be centered around the care of the cognitively impaired and there are many different ways that, that you can do this um, but it can be in it can be in person in services or it can be through the use of some of a, uh, a online educational platform like Relias um, is is popular and the focus needs to be on you know what do we do uh, you know what's a non pharmaceutical intervention that we can do um, to you know uh, adjust someone's behavior rather than that just being our first go to is call the doctor and get you know an antipsychotic medication um, you know our goal is to reduce unnecessary medications that's that's a very big um, thing right now is to make sure that we are not over medicating our residents and um, you know we have to make sure that we we are being good stewards of of this staff training because it's so important to train our staff how we need them to perform and make sure that we set them up for success. The third component of our plan has to be how do we prohibit abuse from occurring whenever possible. That is something that is very important. You want to prohibit these types of actions through, again, hiring proper staff, training the staff, and then there are also other things that you can do in an attempt to prohibit abuse in your facility. You know, you want to take a look at, you know, are there areas of the physical environment that may make abuse or neglect more likely to occur? Do you have a, a lot of secluded areas? that you know would make themselves more likely for abuse or neglect to occur in those areas. You need to make sure that the staff know the resident's plan of care 
so that there's no potential for them to neglect one of their needs unknowingly. And you have to make sure that they know if there are behavioral issues with the resident. Because, you know, if they don't know that they have the behaviors such as wandering or if they are prone to, to self-injuring themselves or if they have, you know, communication issues that, that need to be addressed through the use of uh, appropriate communication boards or, or devices, then, you know, it, you're setting your, your staff up to have a failure to meet the needs of those particular residents. Some of the residents that require more heavy nursing care or are totally dependent residents, they also have very specific needs that the staff might unknowingly neglect if they are unaware how to manage those, those residents. And you have to also make sure that you are using the, the assess and monitor and, and developing of a, appropriate plans of care and that they're changing as different behaviors might develop or different things might come up with a particular resident. One of the other things that is very important, and I ran into this in one of my facilities as an administrator, and I was just shocked, and I had to do a lot of mitigation because this was fairly early on in the whole uh, social media Facebook Live scenario, and I actually had a staff member in my secured unit to take out her cell phone and go on Facebook Live and begin to incite two female residents to, to fight by stating to the other more aggressive natured resident that the other resident had called her a name. And she was inciting the two of them to get into a, a physical altercation and she was recording it on Facebook Live. And she was saying, are you going to let her talk to you that way? You know, do you believe she called you that? And she was laughing about it. It was shocking to me when other staff members brought it to my attention. And again, I had to do a lot of mitigation with the, the families that were involved in this, the residents that were involved. Um, I had to, of course, report it to the state, I had to take statements, and it took it, it, it took a lot of, um, you know, preparation to get across to the staff how not okay that was to do. And again, I will go back to my favorite phrase that common sense is not that common. Common sense would have told me, and probably you, that that would not have been the thing to do. But this particular staff member took it upon herself to do that. Of course, she lost her job over it, but it did bring to light that there are um, ways in which people use um, social media and um, you know photographs, videos, recordings, things like that that could be considered demeaning or humiliating and that is it, it's it's completely not allowed um, and you have to make sure that you train your staff to where they are aware of this so this leads us to identification so how do you and your staff identify whether there are potentially occurrences that could be um, abuse or neglect or exploitation of residents that are going on in your facility. How do you think proactively about identifying these things? And there are, there are lots of things that you can look for just during your daily rounding, your management by walking around, which is why that is so important that you can see whether your residents appear to be being neglected. Are they, are they, are they clean? Are their nails, you know, dirty? Do they have bruising 
um, up and down their arms. There can be reasons for bruising in, in the elderly, such as blood thinners and, and lab draws and things like that. But, but it, you know, it, is there a reason for the bruising? Um, do the bruising uh, areas have particular patterns? Do they look like fingerprints wrapped around someone's wrist or upper arm? Do they look like someone's grabbed them? So you need to be mindful and aware of your residents and, and how they are, how they look, how they are acting, how they're responding. When you walk up to them and you now we can't really do this because of COVID. We don't necessarily walk up and shake their hand or, or we're unable to go up and touch them as we would prior. But, you know, if you if you reach towards them, do they flinch? That's that is a sign of, of physical abuse you know, or neglect that someone is, 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 is harming them, that they, they are afraid of someone reaching out to them. Um, you know, you have to listen as you're walking around, you know, how are your staff talking to your residents? Are they, are they, you know, being demeaning to them in any way? Are they, you know, being kind? And, you know, one of the things that you have to be observant of is talk to your residents, ask them how, how they are being cared for. A lot of times, a resident won't come to you and report anything to you about the way that they're being cared for, whether it's abusive or neglectful. But if you will ask them, oftentimes they will be more transparent in sharing with you something that is going on, such as, well, I'm doing fine, but, you know, I didn't have a great morning because you know, Susie was, was really rough with me when she was getting me out of bed. Okay, so let me stop here and say the statement, Susie was being rough with me this morning, is not necessarily the resident reporting abuse. The next question that you would need to ask is, do you think that she was intentionally being, being abusive to you and rough with you in your care in an effort to somehow harm you or you know did you feel like she had intent to be rough with you can you help me understand what rough looks like to you and the response might be no i don't think she was being abusive or trying to hurt me i just have arthritis and i was really really stiff this morning and she moved my legs too quickly when she went to move my legs to the side of the bed and so i just had a rough morning it wasn't her it was just the movement itself. You can learn a lot from your resident if you just take a moment to clarify what it is that they're really trying to say that maybe they just didn't use the correct wording for. It might not be their intent to make an allegation of abuse, intentional abuse or neglect against a staff member. So make sure that you, you talk to your residents, but ask enough questions to get a full understanding of what it is that they're saying to you and make sure that this, that the resident is actually stating that they feel that they are being abused or neglected in some way. So now you have an allegation of abuse or neglect. What do you do next? Next comes the investigation. That is yet another component of your abuse plan. You know, I was going to drop in a video here in the investigation component, and I went and looked at YouTube and typed in investigation of abuse in nursing facilities. And what popped up primarily were news reports of investigations of allegations of abuse in nursing homes across the country. And that was pretty disheartening to see, but the reality is that there is abuse and neglect in nursing homes, and there are more than enough lawyers that are willing to uh, sue the facilities 
and there are more than enough news reporters who uh, will come in and want to do a news channel five investigates report on um, you know allegations of, of abuse and it's very unfortunate that there were so many videos to be seen and none of which I am choosing to put into this particular uh, PowerPoint but um, certainly it is important to recognize that there is abuse and neglect that goes on in the nursing facilities and you know you don't want yours to be one of those that show up on any of those YouTube videos. So let's talk about the investigation process, which is actually what I was hoping to find a video on, not knowing that if I typed in investigation of abuse in long-term care, that it would pop up all of the lawyer websites and uh, news reports. So what I actually was going to refer to here was how you investigate um, once, of course, you protect the residents because that is your 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 primary um, goal is to protect the residents. So you, that's the first thing you do. And then once you are sure that the resident is is cared for and that the initial reporting of the allegation of abuse is done, then you start your investigation process. So someone has reported an allegation, you've made sure that the resident is protected by, um, let's say, if it's made against Susie for being abusive to Mr. Smith, then you know you have to um, suspend Susie pending the outcome of the investigation of the allegation. That is what should occur. That is what is going to be expected to have occurred is that protection of the resident is paramount. And then the investigation will flesh out whether or not Susie was in fact uh, abusive uh, as it was reported and it will give you an opportunity to then make decisions based on the facts of the uh, investigation that you do. So um, it's important to conduct a thorough and fair investigation but you need to remember that and you need to share this with your staff during orientation that if in fact a resident makes an allegation of abuse against them that you are going to protect the resident first and that they shouldn't take it personally when you suspend them pending the outcome of an investigation after you get their statement they get an opportunity to share their their factual recounting of, of the care provided or the, the circumstances at hand, but you have to have an opportunity to have time to look at all the aspects and investigate properly. So you need to let them know that is how you are going to conduct uh, the situation, the investigation, if it comes up. And if there is, if it is unfounded, if there's no validity to it, based on the factual investigation that you do, then the right thing to do is to pay the staff member for their time away from the facility while you are conducting your investigation. And you need to let them know that that's what you're going to do, that you're going to call them off of their shift, whether it's in mid shift, when you get the allegation, if they're in the, if they're in the facility, you ask them to leave pending the outcome of the investigation, you go ahead and get their statement and you do the investigation thoroughly. Um, that is, that's the way to protect the resident um, is make sure they're protected and then start the investigation process. So let's talk about what the components of an investigation uh, might include. Um, obviously, you're gonna want to interview the involved resident and document the response. You're going to want to make sure that you interview um, the, the staff um, that are being named in the um, abuse allegation and any uh, other witnesses that were perhaps working and that might be able to speak to um, any aspect of the investigation. And their statement might just be, I, I 
I did not during my shift notice anything unusual and that that is still a statement of, of fact. Um, the resident interview, when you uh, interview a resident who has um, cognitive impairment, what you need to remember is that they may not remember the, the exact time or the exact um, you know, date um, and some of the uh, um, less relevant um, facts surrounding an incident, but if you go to them and they recount an incident of abuse or neglect or misappropriation, they are um, usually going to be able to recount the sentinel events over and over. So they'll be able to usually recall that a certain staff member or a certain staff member that looks, they might just be able to describe the, the staff member and not call them by name, um, came in and took something from them or came in and touched them here. And they, um, in general, will be able to say the same thing um, each time that they recount that. So you're definitely going to want to document, document, document. Make sure that you interview the, all the witnesses separately and um, make sure that you conduct what is called a safe survey. So you're going to want to conduct a safe survey and determine if, if um, that resident witnessed anything uh, on whatever night. Um, did they hear anything? Um, you're going to want to ask them, do they feel safe in their environment? Do they feel like they're well cared for in the environment? Are they having any issues with any, um, any of the staff on the night shift or on the day shift? Um, wherever, you know, whenever the incident may have occurred. So definitely do um, a survey of all the cognizant residents on um, a, a certain area or hallway or segment that the care staff um, also cared for if it's an allegation against a staff member so that you can glean uh, again when asked if the residents will have feedback that might help you during the investigation. So another component and um, the, one of what I consider the primary component is protection of the resident. Um, as I've said, you know, the, the alleged abuser must be removed from the facility immediately and not allowed back into the facility pending the outcome of the investigation. So, you know, you, you must um, make sure that the alleged abuser is, is not allowed access to the, to the resident because it could be considered retaliation if they come back into the uh, facility after you have asked them not to come back until you've completed your investigation and they come back to the facility and they threaten the resident they go talk to the resident about the incident that can, that is definitely um, considered retaliation and uh, we do not want that to occur at any time So the final component is, of course, the reporting in response to alleged incidents. And you can see here that there are certain guidelines that um, uh, surround the reporting and the response times to the um, actual uh, allegations. So um, you have to have uh, violations involving mistreatment, neglect, or abuse, including injuries of unknown source and misappropriation of residents' property. They have to be reported immediately, which is... Um, considered to be two hours, uh, no more than two hours after the discovery. They have to be uh, reported to the um, administrator or the DON. And so, oh, they, if they are not there, then a charge nurse or the supervisor in charge would be um, the, the individuals that would need to be alerted to that um, allegation. Here we have just a, uh, another rundown of who all necessary uh, notifications need to be made to. So once the um, allegation is reported to the administrator uh, or his or her designee, then the um, following persons are required to be notified, the state, of course, um, the ombudsman, the resident's representative, the um, 
uh, any law enforcement officials if it again if it um, involves bodily injury significant bodily injury and then the residence attending physician um, and the facility medical director um, all um, are going to need to be made aware of an allegation uh, involving abuse neglect exploitation unknown injury of unknown source that type of thing I wanted to make sure that I outlined the different types of abuse for you. And so here I will let you read through these um, different types of abuse um, for you to know and the actual definition of that type of abuse in case that you needed some clarification there. Okay, so now we have covered the definitions of abuse, the different components of an abuse prohibition plan, and we've also talked about the reporting requirements and all of the different items that go into making a comprehensive plan to avoid abuse and neglect in your facility. But if an allegation of abuse or neglect should occur, what exactly would you need to do to investigate an incident? What would the facility investigation procedures look like? What I've done in the next slides is to share with you things that you would do while conducting an investigation as they relate to the resident, as they relate to any witnesses, and documenting the actual uh, factual component of the investigation. So for the remainder of the um, class, the remainder of this opportunity to share this slideshow with you is I would like for you to do a self-review of the slides that are following um, this, this presentation, this verbal presentation piece. And I'd like for you to think about what you would do as an administrator if you were presented with an allegation of abuse, neglect, or misappropriation, and kind of walk through in your mind what it is that you would do, how you would um, conduct the interviews, how you would document be thinking about what if you were put in a position where you were the person that was charged with investigating and then presenting um, on the five-day investigation summary the outcome of the investigation. And I'd like for you to utilize the slides that follow to be able to formulate this thought process um, as to how you would actually do this if you were in the uh, role of the uh, abuse coordinator, which the administrator in nursing homes are um, designated. And I also want you to keep in mind that you are the protector of your residents and your staff, and you are charged with this, and it is very important part of your role as an administrator. And I want you to take um, the next few slides and, and really come up with a scenario in your mind and walk yourself through it because in your career as a nursing home administrator you are going to be faced with these situations and you're going to have to know how to proceed and you don't want to be stumbling around trying to figure it out um, when you're in the moment so um, you know take take an opportunity to sit outside and and you know take a look at the at the different slides um, that are following this one and really take this opportunity to formulate how would I proceed and with that I will conclude um, my narrative portion of the PowerPoint and I do um, hope that you have a great day and please um, continue the uh, following slides with a great deal of thought and uh, maybe talk amongst yourselves um, at the next opportunity um, to share um, how it made you feel as you are trying to walk through how you would conduct the investigation if you were actually in the role of the administrator.
thank you so much for your time today.